And so tonight, I'm pleased to welcome journalist Isabel Wilkerson, who is with us to discuss The Warmth of Other Suns, the epic story of America's Great Migration. Using profiles of three different black Americans, Ms. Wilkerson illustrates a 55-year-long journey known as the Great Migration. Of The Warmth of Other Suns, The New Yorker writes that it is a deeply affecting, finely crafted, and heroic book. Wilkerson has taken one of the most important demographic upheavals of the past century, a phenomenon whose dimensions and significance have eluded many a scholar, and told it through the lives of three people no one has ever heard of. This is narrative nonfiction, lyrical and tragic and fatalist. What Wilkinson urges, finally, isn't argument at all. It's compassion, hush, and listen. And from the New York Times, it is a narrative epic rigorous enough to impress all but the crankiest of scholars, yet so immensely readable as to land the author a future place on Oprah's couch. A regular, a regular lecturer, prolific writer, and acclaimed journalist, Isabel Wilkerson became the first African-American woman to win the Pulitzer Prize in Journalism in 1994 while working as the Chicago Bureau Chief of the New York Times. She has received a George S. Polk Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and a Journalist of the Year Award from the National Association of Black Journalists. Ms. Wilkerson is now a local Bostonian and a professor in the College of Communications at Boston University. We're absolutely thrilled to have her with us this evening, so please join me in welcoming Isabel Wilkerson. Wow, this is a bit overwhelming. I have been in a cave. I've been in hibernation for 15 years. So long that if it were a human being, it would be in high school and dating, which is scary. So I am just so honored to be here. I have spent all of this time trying to understand a phenomenon that, in fact, I grew up with. And, um, attempting to turn this into something that could become palpable and real and that could carry individuals who might know nothing about this process onto a journey with the people that I've written about. The Great Migration was perhaps the greatest and the biggest underreported story of the 20th century. That is huge. It's really huge. And it was missed for many other reasons, many reasons that um, make a lot of sense, and we can get into that a little bit later if you'd like to hear my thoughts on why it was missed. Um, but I want to spend time on what actually is uh, what I've spent my time doing. So let me define it for you. The Great Migration was the mass relocation of six million African Americans from the South to the North from 1915 to 1970. And it was in some ways what I call the overground railroad because a lot of people had to leave um, under cover of darkness at the last minute, not being able to tell people what they were doing. One of the main reasons I wanted to write this book is because I'd spent a lot of time, as was described, writing about the cities for the New York Times as Chicago bureau chief and as a national correspondent in Detroit and in Chicago. And during that time, I spent a lot of many, many hours and, and many stories about the miseries of the cities and about the difficult uh, lives of people who were in the cities and the middle class of all races and backgrounds who are having a difficult time as we are now under the current economic situation. And so I thought that I'd want to step back a little bit and see what are the things that we all have in common as Americans. And one of the things that we have in common as Americans is that every Every human being on this continent, including the Native Americans, are here because someone came long ago. How, it depends upon how recent our, the, the immigration is, it had occurred. But someone took this great leap of faith into the unknown. They left the only place they'd ever known for a place they'd never seen in hopes that life might be better. And that is exactly what these six million people did within the borders of our own country, which is astounding, that they had to come so far in order to be able to find the rights and privileges that they were born to, but were, which were not recognized in the South. So I want to, um, you know, one of the things that, that happened in the course of, this of the research for this book is that I had to figure out how was I going to tell the story? Where do you begin with something this massive? And I turned back to the oldest thing in human communication, which is telling stories. It's as old as fire. And it's the safest, in some ways, most 
most direct way to begin to tell a story. So what I did was I set out to try to find three people through whom I could tell the story of the Great Migration. They had to be very special people. For one thing, they had to be very patient <laughs> because they were, it was, they were gonna be in for a long ride, much longer than their migration itself because it took so long. <laughs> I needed to find three people who were going to represent the three major streams of this migration. One thing about the Great Migration is we often think of it, well, if you think of it at all, and that's one reason I wanted to do it, is I wanted to restore it to its rightful place in history. I mean, I want to make sure I say that. It should be taught, and it should be on the tip of all of our tongues when we speak about the 20th century because it went on for so long. But I needed to find three people who would represent the three primary streams of this great migration. This great migration was not a haphazard unfurling of lost souls who just ended up anywhere. It was like any other immigration experience of any other group of people who have ever landed on the shores of, uh, of this country. In other words, if you go to Minnesota, you run into a lot of people from Norway and Sweden. Uh, if you go to, to the Lower East Side of, of, of Manhattan historically, you would find many people from, from Italy, as here in, in um, the north end of Boston. And so I, I recognized or it discovered that this was just as predictable as it might have been for any other group of people who've come to this country. So the three streams were on the East Coast, from Florida, the Carolinas, Georgia, and Virginia, to Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, New York, and Boston, the last stop, unless they were going to completely leave the country, which some did, of course, during slavery. Um, and that was the migration that my own personal family was a part of. The second stream was from Mississippi and Arkansas and parts of Louisiana and also parts of uh, Alabama and Tennessee to Detroit, Chicago, uh, Cleveland, the Midwest. And then the final stream, and the stream that's been written about the least in which it was my pleasure to be able to explore, uh, was the migration from Louisiana and Texas to California and the West Coast on, on the whole. And so those were the three things I was looking for when it came to geography. Then there was the issue of time. The migration went on for 55 years. Essentially, it was a, the 20th century uh, redistribution of the South and the North. When the migration began, there were 90% 90, 90 of all African Americans were living in the South. By the time that it was over, nearly half were, li were living outside of the South. In this great arc from Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Cleveland, Detroit, and on to Chicago, and then over to the, to the West Coast, they were everywhere. By the, by the end of the migration, which is 1970. So I needed three people through whom to tell this story. How did I find these three people? That's one of the things that took so much time. Uh, I ended up going everywhere that I could think of that a senior citizen might be who was still healthy and able to talk um, and might be willing to talk with me. So I went to senior centers. I went to Catholic mass, Baptist churches, quilting clubs, AARP meetings on the south side of Chicago. I went to uh, churches where in, in New York, in t everybody is from South Carolina, believe it or not. I went, I went to uh, Creole festivals and dances. There are Juneteenth clubs. You can ask me about Juneteenth later if you like. Um, I, I actually even had a booth at the Juneteenth parade in Los Angeles, which is you know not anything that they teach you in journalism school, but that's what I did. Uh, and I would go to those places, and I would, uh, I would uh, go into one of the senior centers. I was told that a good time to go would be when they were having a, um, a beef dinner um, at the senior centers. That was a big, big deal, and, and I could get a really good crowd there. Um, but I would often run into unusual circumstances when I would run in, when I would go into these places. Uh, one of my visits to Los Angeles was always a big deal because you had to fly out there and make advance uh, preparations for going. And uh, anyway, I showed up at this one senior center in Los Angeles. And I get there, and it's crowded just like here. And the people are listening. And I'm on the program to speak. And uh, the person right in front of me was someone from the LA County Extension Service for, for, for Aging. And uh, he said, I am passing out these, uh, these uh, pamphlets for you to protect yourself 
because we are getting reports that there are unscrupulous people coming to seniors and and presenting themselves as legitimate people, but they're asking all kinds of questions. They're asking questions about where you're from, what did you do for a living, how you got to Los Angeles. Uh, they want to know about your housing situation, if you have children, uh, what your children are doing. They want to know all of this information about you, and we're finding that they're going in there, they're robbing, they're stealing uh, from the seniors and taking advantage of it. Before you know it, they have your social security number and they have cleaned you out. And then it was my turn next. <laughs> so I uh, had to go up and make my presentation. And I told them that I was uh, a, a writer who was doing a book about the Great Migration. And if you were born, uh, if you were, uh, came to Los Angeles between uh, these years, if you would please talk with me. And um, pretty much everything that this man said that you're not supposed to tell people is kind of like what I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> and they all lined up and talked to me anyway, thank goodness. So I didn't have any trouble with that. But it shows you some of the pitfalls of entering this world uh, where you have to depend upon and you're hoping to run into people uh, and learn this, hear the stories of people who might otherwise not, you wouldn't have access to. Okay, so I went to all these senior centers and I narrowed it down to 30 people, any of which these, these, these 30 people could have been, would have been perfectly fine. And I, uh, some of the people were, had, had hobo that actually caught the train. They hopped on a train and had to actually, you know, almost like out of a movie, climb from car to car to make sure that they were evading the, uh, they call them railroad bulls, the men who would, uh, this is out of a Western or something, but they're real, the railroad bulls who were, there to keep people from riding the trains uh, in that way. Uh, they'd have to jump off ravines. This is in, in the book, as a, as a matter of fact, but these people did not make it in the, as one of the three. There, were, there was a one woman who had left Chicago, left Mississippi for Chicago um, for um, the most uh, ordinary and also um, s sweetly devious reasons that you could imagine. She had married the wrong man in Mississippi, and or felt she had, and wanted to follow a man that she actually did believe she was in love with who had gone off to Chicago. Uh, she ended up uh, with him. Uh, it did not work out, and she ended up being married four times. Her name is very, very long. It's like Ruby Welch, Mays, McGowan, Smith, and there's another name I can't think of. But in any case, she was quite fascinating, too, uh, and she didn't make it. So there are a lot of people who, who might have made it. But I ended up with these three. Now, the first one is Ida May Brandon Gladney, and she was a sharecropper's wife who was terrible at picking cotton, just awful. She would just fall on her sack in the 100 degree heat and not be able to keep up with her husband who was far down the row. And you don't think of people being good or bad at cotton, you just think of them as picking it. And actually there was a, there was a sort of skill to it. And I spent a lot of time reading about what it took to, to pick cotton. For one thing, cotton is very light if you think about Q-tips or just cotton balls. And they needed to, to pick 100 pounds a day. That means 100 pounds of nothingness because what does a cotton ball weigh? And they had to drag the sack behind them throughout the heat. And she was just not very good at it. It's, it was mind-numbing work. It was like picking 100 pounds of feathers, if you can imagine how much work was involved in that. And then you'd have to stop that day when you could no longer see and start up again and do the exact same thing. She was terrible at it, and she didn't like it. She and her husband ended up leaving uh, Mississippi uh, under um, difficult circumstances, as was the case for some people. It turned out that one of the cousins of her husband was beaten within an inch of his life um, over a theft that he had not committed. In other words, he was accused of a theft of something so mundane, a turkey, for example. It was owned by the planter for whom they all worked, and uh, he was beaten uh, for that, beaten almost to death, her husband, Ida May's husband, went to jail to retrieve him. That's where he was taken, not to any hospital. I mean, they wouldn't have been taken to the hospital anyway. Um, he got him and found him in such horrific circumstances that he went, went home to his wife and he said, this is the last crop we're making. And so they left. 
They didn't leave instantly. They had to uh, divest themselves of what little they owned and prepare to leave. They told no one that they were leaving, only her mother. And they prepared to, they got off the man's land and then they left. The second person was, is George Starling, who was a college student who had to drop out of college because the money ran out. And there were no schools that would permit um, black people in Florida, where he was from, uh, in the county where he was living or anywhere nearby. There, were, there was only Florida A&M which permitted them and it was hours and hours away. So he, he had to drop out of school. They could no longer um, support him going off to college that far. And so he returned to the work that was the work of the people in the place where he lived, which was picking oranges and grapefruit at great peril. They often had to go into 30 and 40 foot trees. That's how big the citrus uh, trees would get in Florida. And uh, they would have to splice together the ladders in order to go up into the limbs of the tree, position themselves in the crook of the limb of the tree. Many times people would fall out of the tree, break a limb. Um, very dangerous. They were being paid 10 and 12 cents a box for boxes of fruit that would then sell for three or four dollars on the open market. And he was, uh, he'd gone, he was smart enough to be able to read the paper. This was never, not hidden actually. It was, they were quite proud of how much money they were making in Florida for this. And he began to agitate for higher wages, meaning a nickel more a box. The growers were not accustomed to being. Uh, confronted in that way. And uh, one day George got, uh, someone came up to him and warned him that he'd heard, overheard the Grove owners talking about what they were going to do to him. They were planning a lynching of him because he was causing mu too much trouble. In those days, unions were not permitted in the South anyway, and particularly not the kind of thing he was talking about. Also during that era, there was a lot of uh, there were a lot of arrests of, of, of black men in particular for vagrancy if they were not seen working. So here he was actually telling people to, to not work and um, at a time when they were actually arresting people. They were not, and I, I mean not working on a Saturday. There was one of his crew members was actually arrested on a Saturday because he wasn't working. Um, so he ended up leaving after being given that news and he went to New York. And then finally, uh, the person whom the reviewers seem to really like is uh, Dr. Robert Foster. He was a surgeon. Uh, he had been in the army. He had done surgery in the army for his country during the Korean War. But when he got home to Monroe, Louisiana, he was not permitted to perform sur surgery in his own hometown of Monroe, Louisiana. And so he decided he would take this treacherous trip unbeknownst to him, it was way more treacherous than he had anticipated, and he ended up uh, going to California. Now his migration is one that just, I want to tell you a little bit about some of the reporting that went into this. I ended up wanting to recreate his journey. I wanted to recreate all their journeys, but his was the most treacherous. What happened was he was not able to complete, he was not able to stop for a good stretch of the journey. And so I said to myself, well, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it and see if I can do that. He had given precise direction, uh, description of where he stopped and where he went. He said, this thing, I've gone over 3,000 times trying to figure out why this happened and what happened. And so he gave me precise descriptions of exactly where he went. And with that, I got, I, I rented a Buick, which is what he had driven. He had a, a Buick Roadmaster in 1951. I had um, an, uh, the newest one that they had available. He was quite proud of his Buick. And uh, set out on a journey with my parents, who were also part of the migration they had been. And uh, we made it as far as Yuma, Arizona. And my parents said, uh, I was beginning to lose, you know, I, was be my, I wanted to experience this. I wanted to experience what happens when you have to drive this far without being able to stop. I wanted to, the swollen fingers that are gripping the wheel. I wanted to feel the heaviness of your eyelids as they're about to just fighting sleep and wanting to, wanting to close and go to sleep so badly that they actually ache. I wanted to see what it was like to be driving in the darkness along hairpin t curves in the desert and not be able to see your way clear because you're still a long way from California. You know, in the West, the states are big, much bigger than here. <laughs> you know, f f five or six 
uh, states on the, in the East could fit in one of those states. Texas is a country unto itself. <laughs> so uh, when we got to Yuma, Arizona, and I was beginning to veer off the road and cross into another lane, my parents said, we're stopping. For our sake, we're stopping. <laughs> You're stopping. It was all my father could do to keep himself from, from taking the wheel from me. And I said, nope, I've got to do it. I've got to do it. He did it himself. He didn't have anyone to relieve him. He had no one else in the car with him. He was by himself. Um, he didn't have all the things that we're accustomed to, no cell phones, no CDs, nothing. It's almost um, unimaginable. And the cars weren't made as well. There were lots of cars that would fall, fall uh, would, would uh, overheat on the way. It was a treacherous, treacherous time, if you think about it, just driving alone in the middle of nowhere. It's a big, big country. In any case, I was unable to recreate to the letter what he had done, and I felt sad that I wasn't, and it actually made it all the more poignant what he ended up doing. He had to make it on his own. Um, and it's just, a, to me, it's a powerful part of the book. I want to I wanna, uh, end with, my general talk, because I want to hear what your questions might be. There's so many ways I could talk about this. I think the main thing I want people to take away from this book is the idea that we have so much more in common than we've been led to believe. One of the greatest tragedies of the 20th century, I believe, and one of the greatest tragedies that comes through in the idea of what these people were seeking. They were seeking what anyone else who ever left the only place they ever knew for a place they'd never seen would want. And that was basically to be free. And one of the greatest tragedies is that once they arrived in these cities, after all that they had been through in the Jim Crow South, everything, um, and I can give you a little bit of detail, too, about what it was like. I have some of the rules and the laws that someone sat down to write. But in any case, after all that they had been through, they then got to the big cities and found that they had competition that they had not anticipated and people who found them threatening because they were accustomed to basically working for almost nothing. Many of the people had been working for nothing, especially if they'd been sharecropping. Very rarely would they clear anything, so they were accustomed to lots of hard, backbreaking work for little pay. That meant that wherever they went, they would potentially depress the wages of wherever they went. And, and people who were in the northern cities knew that. And so there was a great effort to, to stop it. After each wave, people thought, OK, it's done. World War I, it's over with. It wasn't over. The people, no one told the people, so they kept coming. Uh, World War II, it's done. The people kept coming. No one told them it was over with. 50s, it's over. It's done. Nope, they step, still kept coming until 1970. And the, the, the reasons for why they were leaving finally ended in the South. The South began to change. And then they were no longer needing to come here as often. And even now, the children are often returning back. But the, the, the point of this is that the people who were converging on these big cities in the North, Chicago and Boston and Cleveland and, and Detroit, Los Angeles, there were waves of immigrants coming from all over the world at the same time they were arriving. And they were all of this, they were all really the same people. Many of them were people of the land, people who had also left uh, oppression and persecution back where they were from and wanting something better, maybe not even for themselves because they were gonna, they had already lived part of their life. Whatever education, however poor it was, they already had it. But maybe it would be better for their children. And so they were all coming, wanting the same thing, coming for very similar reasons, the exact same people with the exception of the one thing that made them different, which was the color of their skin. And then the uh, often northern industry used that against used it to create a wedge, allowing some into a union and use, using others, the ones from the South, often as union uh, busters. They would, use, they would hire them, but they would be desperate to be up here. And, um, and it created this great wedge. What did we lose as a country because these people did not get the opportunity to get to really know one another, that they were riven apart from one another? And it's really one of the great tragedies, I think, which is, again, the reason why I wanted to do it. I wanted people to realize how very much we have in common as people. And I hope that we've grown a lot from that era. In fact, I know that we have. And I'll um, give you one example of why. Um, my. My migration, my migration experience is that of from Georgia. My mother was originally from Georgia, and she migrated to Washington, D.C. toward the end of World War II. And uh, 
uh, years later, in the 50s, my father actually migrated from Southern Virginia to Washington. So had they not migrated, I wouldn't be here and you wouldn't have this book because I wouldn't exist, <laughs> which is kind of a very American story too. I mean, how many people exist here because some great grandmother from Poland actually married somebody from uh, a great grandfather from Ireland and here you, you know, decades later, or generations later, here you are. I mean, how many Americans would not exist had there not been someone in our backgrounds who did this very thing? This is much closer in my own background, but literally I wouldn't have existed because they never would have met. And so that's part of my migration migration experience, but in the course of working on this book and interviewing all these people, 1,200 people, my mother was one of the most difficult people to interview. She just would not talk. She never talked about it when I was growing up. She only took me home to, uh, to Georgia once uh, when I was six years old, and um, she just didn't talk about it. Once she left, she left. Some people changed their names. My mother added an E to her name. Like this, suddenly she's a whole new person. Uh, she added an E, it was Ruby, R-U-B-Y. The E made her more cosmopolitan and sophisticated, I guess, she was in Washington. In any case, she eventually began to talk after I came back with all these stories from other people. You know, suddenly she was feeling a little left out. You know, there's nothing like a little competition to get people talking. So she's told me the story of, of my grandfather, whom I never met. My grandfather had gone to, to college, he'd gone to Morehouse, but he found that in the era in which he was coming into, the, into his own in the 20s, there were no jobs for him with a, he had a theology degree, what, what, what could you do with that really? Uh, he was in a small town in Georgia where there would not have been churches to support the lifestyle of what you might expect a, a college degree to do, so he ended up getting a job to take care of his family, operating an elevator in the insurance company in Rome, Georgia. But what he really wanted to do was to be a writer. And he wrote reams and reams and reams of what we believe to have been a memoir, which no one at the time paid attention to. I think my mother probably drew crayons or something on it. I mean, they just didn't take it very seriously. And he then gave his two daughters a typewriter, a corona typewriter, that he hoped they would be able to learn to use one day so that they would maybe become uh, want to write. My mother had no interest in writing, and so they just pecked on it and just played with it. But in any case, he wanted to be a writer but he could not walk in the front door of the Rome News Tribune in those days, not possible in the 30s. And years later, decades later, the granddaughter that he would never meet, would never know would even exist, would then go on to write for the New York Times. He could never in his wildest dreams have imagined that. The typewriter went unused for all those generations, all those decades, and then finally someone without even knowing it existed. I didn't find out about it until much later when my mother finally told me and she gave it to me that he had actually wanted to do this all along. So that shows you how far we have come as a country and even in my own family. So I'd like to, to uh, end with uh, the epigraph from the book, which is from Richard Wright, from which the title comes. I discovered this while reading, uh, at one point I was reading a book a day. Speak about being at a bookstore, it's all I can do is just to dro drop everything and go looking in the shelves because I just love bookstores. And um, I would read a book a day and one of them was the autobiography of Richard Wright. And uh, it was the annotated version which meant that it had been it had been repeated, it had been reprinted as he originally wished it to be. And that meant that this, this part was actually in the footnotes on page 496. And I got to read the footnotes and I discovered this. It actually represents what any of us who might ever have a dream that might take us far away, even in our own little circle, just wherever it might take us. It's an inspiration for anyone who needs to make this great decision. And so what he said was this. I was leaving the South to fling myself into the unknown. I was taking a part of the South to transplant in alien soil, to see if it could grow differently, if it could drink of new and cool rains, bend in strange winds, respond to the warmth of other suns, and perhaps to bloom. Thank you, and I'd love to take your questions.
It went on for 55 years, really maybe 60 years. I mean, no one knows the exact date of the first person and no one knows the exact date of the last person, but it went on for essentially three generations. That meant three generations of reporters, of journalists who might have otherwise covered it. And, and, and of course, as I said, when it began, people thought it would be over. People thought that it was going to be a World War I migration. These people were recruited. They didn't just start coming. Um, this is in some ways, you know, history has a long arm. It doesn't happen instantly. Human beings move slowly through huge ages and eras. And this is in some ways, this great migration is in some ways a continuation of the Emancipation Proclamation, which was not lived up to at the time. We know that there was reconstruction. It lasted for you know, too short a period of time for the people who were looking for re some relief from what they were experiencing. It lasted for about 10 years when the North essentially pulled out. And then things got so much worse for the people who were there, because that is when Jim Crow was, re was instituted for the first time. Slowly, the, the vise was tightening on the people who had grown just so accustomed in that short period of time to the freedoms that were just so short-lived. And so by the time this migration occurred it only occurred it could only occur because things opened up in the north it did not occur because the people uh, suddenly decided that they were going to go north and so it, when the north came calling during world war one um, the south didn't care for that too much and they instituted all kinds of efforts to keep them from leaving they would actually there would be police who would board the trains when they saw that there were many of their basically cheap labor on board easily recognizable because they were black they would close down the ticket counters so that people couldn't buy tickets they would um, arrest people from the railroad platforms and then ultimately so that's how they dealt with the supply and then to deal with the demand they ended up uh, requiring exorbitant unbelievable amounts of money for northern who wanted to recruit black labor in the South. In Macon, Georgia, it, was, it cost $25,000 to get a license to be a recruiter of black labor in the South. Now, $25,000 to do anything is exorbitant now. It would have been astronomical in 1917. And so it had a great dampening effect. Uh, it would seem to have had a great dampening effect on that effort. But once the things were opening up and word spread, people began to find other ways to get out. They would buy tickets in the next town over where they wouldn't be recognized. They would leave in the middle of the night. They did all people, men dressed as women and vice versa in order to get out. And so they did whatever it, they, whatever it took once they recognized that there was an opportunity in the North. And so it was a World War I migration that people wrote about a lot. And then people thought it was going to be over. And so they wrote about it then, and then they moved on to the effects of the people who were there at that time. So the story changed once there was a critical mass of people all hemmed in together because the story then became how people were living one on top of one another in, uh, in uh, closed in, roped off essentially ghettos in the north, and that became the new story. So the migration itself, the continuing waves of people coming and coming and following aunts and great uncles and uh, nephews and neighbors just didn't get told because now there was a different story. So all these, all these generations, very few people sat down with the individuals who did this. And there was a great urgency, I felt, to get to these people before it was too late because they were getting up in age. In fact, um, to me, one of the lessons of the book, personally, is to never give up. I mean, clearly this took me 15 years. And when I started, I don't know why people do this to you. People will tell you, well, you'll never be able to do this, you'll never be able to do this. So one person said, you'll never be able to find anybody from World War I. I said, well, when it started in World War I, so I'll be looking for people from World War I. Well, you'll never find anybody from World War I. I mean, look how old they must be. Of course, that's, don't say that to a journalist, because I was bound and determined to find one, and I did. He actually didn't make it in. Um, he was 96 at the time that I found him in 1996, and I actually got him a birthday card. There are actually birthday cards for, that say, happy 100th birthday. Talk about optimism. <laughs> you know, that Hallmark would make a card that would say happy 100th birthday. Uh, and um, he was a World War I vet. So um, what I'm saying, I guess, to answer your question is that it went on for so long that the story changed, the people covering it changed, 
For example, Carl Sandburg was one of the one of the first reporters. We think of him as you know as this as the our, our one of our most famous poets. But he actually was a reporter in Chicago, and he was he wrote about the migration in the early years, 1919, 1918, uh, in Chicago. And so, of course, by the time the migration got to 1970, many of the people who would have originally been writing about it in the beginning were gone, retired at at best and and really literally gone from from our mist at worst and so that was one reason why it wasn't covered that's a really good question because it gets to the timing the migration demographically statistically ended in 1970 which would have been just before the you know the auto industry had it had its begin the beginning of a decline there um, the answer to the answer to the question is that there were six million people approximately who left the south and that means that there's 6 million reasons they all had their own different reasons and that's one of the reasons one of the goals of the book is to show that there were many different reasons in other words there were the there was the overarching condition of life in the south so let's talk a little bit about what was the over what were the overarching conditions of life in the south what is what was it like to be in that situation black and white it actually hurt both sides and i just think People don't often realize that. For example, it was illegal in Birmingham. It was illegal in Birmingham for black people, for a black person and a white person to play checkers together. That is just, I mean, who sits down and thinks of something like that? So, so somebody saw a black person and a white person playing checkers together and said, oh, no, 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 we can't have this, and actually wrote that down as a law in Birmingham. There were black taxi cabs. There were cabs for blacks, and there were pla cabs for whites. There were ambulances for whites, and ambulances, if they were available at all, for blacks. There were black hearses and white hearses, for those who didn't survive whatever happened to them, that put them in the ambulance to begin with. There were black. Uh, there were there was a black uh, bo uh, uh, window at the bank in a, at a bank in Atlanta. There were black elevators and white elevators. The, the black elevators were the freight elevators in Atlanta, for example. There were black telephone booths and white telephone booths. Now we have no telephone booths. But then there were ones for whites and ones for blacks. There's no reference in the book at all to water fountains because we know about that already. I set out to find every example that I could of just how arcane and insane <laughs> some of these laws were. For example, in South Carolina, it was illegal in certain workplaces for blacks and whites to go up the same staircase. How do you, how do you even manage it? You try to think, what are the logistics of that? You have one staircase, so what do you do? How do you, how do you manage that? Some of this is hard to fathom, how you even make something like this work. And then finally, well, there's so many, so many examples, but one that is probably the most uh, out of keeping with the whole idea of what was to be going on at the moment was that there were actually black and white Bibles in courtrooms. There was a black Bible and a white Bible. None of this was, no one, this was not something that people were ashamed of or trying to hide. This was actually, I discovered this uh, in uh, one of the North Carolina newspapers. And the way that I became aware of it was, there was a problem in one courtroom during a trial once because they could not find the black Bible. So the court proceedings had to stop. The bailiff had to go and find the black Bible because the black, a black person had taken the stand. And you know, so that's how I found out that that was considered standard. And the judge basically said, well, look, if we're going to, you know, this is the law. If we're going to do it, we might as well recognize the law because we are in a, in a court of law. So. That was what they were leaving. Those, that was the circumstance under which they were, they were living under. It was essentially a caste system that made it difficult for anyone, black or white, to get to know one another. And one of the things that my mother told me was that her mother uh, would take in laundry to make extra money. Uh, and uh, these would generally be well-to-do white women in Rome, Georgia, who would come and deliver her laundry. And one of the women in particular, whenever she would come by, she and my grandmother would just have such a ball. They'd be laughing. They'd be chatting. They were, they, my mother said they would have been the best of friends in another time and place. But they knew that they could only take it so far. And it would never leave the, my, my grandmother's living room. Once the woman left, they would not be able to acknowledge one another outside of that. What a loss that is. Whole generations of people who didn't get a chance to know other people who they might have been the best of friends with. And that's the reason why I say it was a loss both 
for black people and white people in, uh, in that caste system. Because a caste system means everybody, if you think of a caste, literally, everyone is in a rigid place and they must hold fast that place or else risk ostracism on the case for the whites and death at worst for ca the case of blacks. So it was a, a, a frightening kind of rigidity under which they lived. And so it was that system that they all were having to negotiate and ultimately were leaving. But the precipitating event that might make one person leave or another might be different for them all, as I described with the three of them. There's something different that happened for each one. So there would have been six million different precipitating events that would say for an individual, this is it, I'm leaving. He couldn't stop because it turned out that Jim Crow, as he understood it, Jim Crow as we understand it, which means segregated facilities, extended far farther than he had anticipated. It actually extended into parts of the West. For example, in Las Vegas, the casinos were, were segregated. They were not, blacks were not permitted to go into the casinos even to lose their money. <laughs> which is like, maybe that was a good thing on one level, but the thing is that they were not permitted the choice of going into a casino well until the late 50s. And um, there's a reference to that in the book because uh, um, the good doctor actually had a, a gambling habit. And um, if I can find it, I'd like to read you the uh, opening to him because he's he was quite a character. Uh, I, if I don't find it, I will tell you this. Um, when I met him, the very first time I met him, uh, he, we sat down and he was a very formal man in a now informal time. So he just would have a, just a, a fit just watching people walk down the street with pants falling down. Oh, he'd just have a fit. He'd actually find all of us uh, somehow uh, lacking because we would, not, we would be underdressed for him. He was quite something. Um, so when I met him, um, he showed me to uh, his, his uh, living room, which was all sherbetty, like out of a Doris Day film. And um, he was of that era. And he um, brought out lemon pound cake and ice cream. I had just had uh, lunch and was not the least bit interested or hungry. But he was not the type of person that you say no to. So I accepted it. And he watched with each forkful. And I ate it all. <laughs> And then he proceeded, I proceeded to ask him some, uh, you know, about himself, and he said, I love to talk, and I am my favorite subject. <laughs> so I knew I had my man in California with him. So I hope that that may have answered your question, or did I not get to answer your question? Oh, yes, getting back to it. Uh, there are all kinds of perils that they face, running out of gas, radiator overheating, none of those things uh, happened to him. He had what he called a chariot, which was his Buick, and he was quite proud of it. But he found that he was not permitted to stop for the night throughout the long journey. He could not find a room. They would not allow him to stay. So. There are always businesses that spring up as a result of even oppression. And so one of the things that was very popular at the time was that because there were so few places that they could stay, they, they really literally could not plan on staying anywhere. So they generally would stay with friends. But if they were in a place or p traveling a long distance where they might not know anyone, they first had to make sure that they had plenty of ice in case something happened with a radiator. They made sure that they had all the food that they could possibly need because they would not be assured of being able to stop and get food. They had the Bible with them and they often read the, uh, one of the Psalms that, that, that was uh, important to protect pilgrims along a long journey. And um, they often had with them uh, what's called a green book. Which, are, which obviously are no longer necessary. And they're quite collectible. I actually found one on eBay, and I was quite proud of myself to find it. Um, but they, the green books would be uh, little pamphlets that would have the list of, of hotels with big quotation marks, because the hotels would often be just someone's room. I mean, it would just be someone had a row house in uh, St. Louis, or they had an apartment, a flat uh, somewhere uh, in Nashville, and people could stay there for the night. They made, them, they made their room available for travelers who needed a place to stay. And the accommodations were atrocious, as you might imagine, because there was no competition. And so traveling was hazardous on, for so many people in so many ways. And the Green Book was the only way that they might be able to assure themselves of having at least some place. It did not assure them of 
cleanliness. It didn't assure them that the sheets had been changed. I mean, nothing. I mean, there was no guarantee except they would be able to at least rest their eyes for the night. And he wasn't able to do that. Um, for one thing, when you're in the desert, once he'd reached a certain point, there literally is no place. Even now, there's no place to stop for any of you who've taken the, the, the drive. Once you get into parts of Arizona and New Mexico, it's just there are signs that say, you know, 80 miles to the next gas station. It's a frightening thing. And he'd never taken this drive before, and he was not a good driver. All of his friends would say, I don't even know how he made it because he was a terrible driver. But somehow, I mean, he lived to tell the story. So, because what happens is this book covers, st starts with them from beginning, you know, the beginning of their journey, going back to childhood, the decision. I was really fascinated with how they made the decision. Why did they choose this particular place? What was there for them? What, did, what was the thought process? How does any immigrant make a decision to do something so drastic as to leave the only place they've ever known for a place they've never seen? So, yes, I, I did uh, uh, have to talk with them and do research on what was the reception that they got where they arrived. And they were not welcome. You know, the companies and businesses wanted them, but that did not mean that the people who were already there wanted them, for many different reasons. For some people, for working whites, they felt this is going to this is going to lower all of our wages because now we have all these people who will take almost anything to get a job. And remember, they were highly motivated, these migrants, these original migrants, because they could not fail. Failure was not an option. Because what would happen if they failed? They would have to go back home. And there would be people clucking and just saying, see, I knew they weren't going to make it. I knew they would get up there, and they weren't going to be able to make it. And I knew they'd come back here, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, saying that they, you know, they just couldn't survive and they couldn't make it, and we'd have to take them back in again. So failure was not an option. They had to survive out of pride, if nothing else. Um, so there were people who were who felt threatened in terms of the what was going to happen to their station, and uh, there were people who, you know, there was there was violence. There was violence in the north, and there was violence in the south. I mean, there were there were no uh, cross burnings in the north, but there would be uh, there would be uh, Fires would be set to their homes. Bombs would be, uh, their many houses were bombed in the north. Fi g guns would be uh, fired into the, into the homes. There were all kinds of things that happened to people um, when they ventured beyond the boundaries of the places that they were supposed to be living or, or limited to. But one of the, the most surprising uh, sources of resistance was actually from uh, blacks who were already in these cities, who were situated. And the reason for that was because they had such a tenuous hold on their own position as it was. To have all these people coming up from the South, often the place that they themselves had left, coming in and threatening in huge numbers, because again, because they were not immigrants, not they were acting like immigrants, but they were not immigrants. How could you stop a flow of people who were not really having to cross a border if they could manage to get out of Georgia, manage to get out of Mississippi and get to Chicago or Detroit or to Philadelphia, then they were all right. I mean, then they were there and they were and there would be more people coming. No one had an idea of what was this going to be, how many people would be coming. There was no way to to stop this thing. And so the people who felt most threatened were those who had already found a way to coexist in a tiny minority that and found ways to have their, their beauty parlors or their barber shops or their they were domestics, they were janitors, whatever they were, but they'd made a little life for themselves. And it's often said that when immigrants arrive in a place, they're the first ones to want to shut the door. And in the case and that was the case here. But there was a lovely statement by one woman who was asked, you know, how do you feel about these people coming up? I mean, as it turns out, they were they needed to be sort of seasoned and, and told how to, you know, not to hang their their wash outside and to, you know, not, you know, not wear, you know, head scarves outside to comport themselves in a certain way, especially if they were coming directly from the field. And so a woman um, who had been there for a while, she happened to have been in Oakland for a while, and someone asked her, how do you feel about these people coming up and, um, you know, with their country ways and, and all, and you're so cityfied and sophisticated. And she said, well, maybe it won't be for them. Maybe they won't learn. Maybe they won't really be able to truly benefit in the same way and understand what this is all about and how they should carry themselves. But their children will, and their children's children will. And so that was kind of a hopeful, wonderful statement from her. It wasn't all negative.
I, you know, I tried to look at things that had not been written about as much. And so one of the things that I, and of course there's a ref, reference, I mean you can't talk about the migration without talking about the effect on music overall. But one of the things that was most striking to me was the effect on music beyond just Chicago. The effect on music uh, as we know it. It's hard to imagine what would we be listening to had there been no great migration. And I'll give you an example. For one thing, Motown would simply not have existed. It would not have existed. We would not have Motown. You know why? Because Barry Gordy, the founder of Motown, his parents were from Georgia, and they migrated to Detroit, where he was born. And then when he got to be uh, a grown, a young man, he looked around himself, and he saw uh, the, uh, the talent that was around him. And that talent, these were all children of the Great Migration. Diana Ross, was uh, the, a her, her mother was from Alabama. She they migrated, and she was born in Detroit. Aretha Franklin, who was not actually, she was of that ilk, but not actually formally with Motown. Her family had come up from the South. The Jackson Five, the entire Jackson family came from, uh, the, the parents came from Alabama. It's, it's hard to fathom what music would be. I mean, and, and beyond Motown, so many other people, Prince, for example, his, his uh, father was from Louisiana. I mean, just astounding. Um, and jazz, there's no way to know what would have happened. Would jazz even exist? The three main pillars of jazz, Miles Davis, his parents migrated from, uh, from Arkansas to Illinois, where he had the opportunity to do something other than whatever would have been the limited opportunity in the cotton growing uh, you know, area of Arkansas. Um, the Thelonious Monk, his parents, my, his parents brought him to New York when he was five years old. They left North Carolina for Harlem when he was five. So he had the opportunity to, to go to northern schools and to get exposed to music. That would have been an incredible luxury uh, in the South. Who would have had the time to do that if you were out picking tobacco? And John Coltrane. John Coltrane migrated when he was 17 years old from North Carolina, not far from where Thelonious Monk had been from. They did not know each other in the South. And he went to Philadelphia. And in Philadelphia, he got his first alto sax. What would music be if, we did, if that had not happened? It's stunning to think what would have happened if, if they had not migrated. I'll, I'll, for those of you who can't hear, what she said was that I, I, I said I was reading a book a day, and sometimes it would be about cotton production, and it might be about Jim Crow laws. I became obsessed with those. But I also had to read about lynchings, and that made me not very popular at dinner parties. People would say, well, what did you do today? They didn't really want to know what I'd been doing that day. <laughs> Well, it was isolating. I was in a cave for a very long time. But um, I think that what I did was, you know, a lot of people ask, you know, it, it, to say that, you know, there are parts of it that are, you know, uh, painful. Uh, there are parts of it that are uplifting and, and, and inspiring. Um, and those difficult parts, how did you get through them? And I think that I got through them because I thought about people needed to know. And the goal was to make it come alive for people so that they could picture themselves in those small towns looking at this wide open field of cotton that needed to be picked and almost wanting to cry, <laughs> um, of having to drive through the desert um, in that way, of hearing about a lynching in a town um, you know, not far away where actually in one place in Texas, the, the, because they weren't able to actually get to the man and kill him, they then burned down the courthouse. I mean, it's just insane That's, so to hear about this happening. Um, I wanted to make it come alive, so there was this quest for understanding, so that what I was discovering was actually going to be to the good, ultimately, because it was going to be helping this era come alive so that it would be something that people could you know, read about and learn about and grow from, all of us, because we were now aware of what maybe we were not aware of before. So that's what you know, got me through it, thinking about that. I actually have been asked if one is better than the other, and I'd like to say categorically no. I don't want to t touch that. Um, uh, and I, don't be I believe that there's a reason for people who stay. There actually are terms for it. That the people who leave, there's a term called the migrant advantage, which you might say all of our forebears must have had, because otherwise we wouldn't be here. And um, some people might take it even further and say that that's what makes the country great or whatever. But the thing, there is something different about people who will leave everything. For one thing, people who will leave everything have often generally have more resources, more, more resourcefulness, I should say. They tend to have more grit. They, they tend to be less patient 
content with the status quo. They tend to be more adventuresome, more willing to take risks. They're greater risk takers. And they ultimately are people who are willing to, to jump off a cliff and not know for sure where, it's gonna, where they're going to land. The people who stay tend to be those who are more um, attached to the land, more maybe perhaps more sentimental, not able to turn their back on all that they've known. Not one is better than the other, but they both serve a purpose. In this case, there are people who stayed who said, we need to stay here so you have a place to come back to when you want to see home again. And that's a lovely thing. I mean, people are often discovering. I, I know friends who are going back to Scotland, and they're looking for for bears there, or going back to Italy. And that's a lovely thing. And they'll find people who are there, and they'll find a difference. There is this pure, distilled, original culture that remains wherever we're from. And then what happened in, in our culture with the Great Migration, for example, is that that pure, distilled southern black culture came in contact with the metabolism and uh, vibrancy of the north, of the northern cities, and created whole new art forms. Toni Morrison, for example, is one of the uh, children of the migration, and of course the music that we've talked about. So there is something different about those people, but I think that we need both in order to be whole, and that's what I take from all of this. So thank you very much.